was going to say you should move to Nelson because I'm pretty sure that we have more coffee shops per like population than any other city ever anywhere. Welcome to Keep It Fictional, a weekly podcast for book lovers by book lovers. Build your to be read list with Sadie, Liz, Virginia, Fiona, and Kareen from the Port Moody Public Library. Warning, this podcast contains strong opinions and may cause an increase in your library holds list. I am very excited to be here with you all today to talk about something that is very near and dear to my heart and to my life. Um, Some of you may know this about me, some of you may not. I grew up in a relatively small community in the interior of British Columbia. And because of that experience, because of the wonderful joy of growing up that I experienced um, in my childhood, I have always had a very fond place in my heart for small towns and small cities. So that is what we are going to be talking about today. So some books, they're set in large metropolitan areas. Some books are set in fantastical worlds, but some books are set in small, cozy, warm, and welcoming towns. And these towns might not always appear to have too much going on. There's not a lot of people. There's not a lot of activities to do all the time. But under the surface, I think you find that there is more that happens in these small towns than you might otherwise think. And these small towns in fiction are often the settings for exciting mysteries, small town romances, and maybe even some fantasy You never know what will happen in a small town. There's so many other things as well. And I'm sure all of our books today will touch on many of these elements and more. So on that note, I would love to introduce you to my colleagues today who are going to be talking books with me. We have Virginia, we have Fiona, Kareen, and Liz. Hello, welcome everyone. And thank you so much for joining me today to talk about small towns. Now, I just want to get a sense. Are we all city people? Are we small town people? I, I feel like we've all, for the most part, made the choice to either be in the city or to stay in the city. So I'm just curious, is that was that a choice that you made because you are against small towns or potentially for another reason? What, what do we think about small town living? Never lived in a small town ever. Hong Kong is the complete opposite of a small town. So I don't know what a small town is at all. So perfect. On the opposite of the spectrum, I grew up in a very small town, which had a population of at most 6,000 people. And I didn't even live in the town. I lived out in the country. So um, I really enjoyed living in a small town, but because of kind of going to university and and trying to further my education, I had had to leave. And um, going back to a small town is sometimes uh, hard to find jobs and employment. So I think I'm like a small town person at heart. Um, I think that's why I really like Port Moody is because it has a very very like small town feel to it. Um, Small town girl in a big city. There you go. There you go. Even got a catchphrase. Um, I grew up in the suburbs, so that horrible in between, um, <laughs> but I have lived in, in most different iterations, uh, but with Vancouver being the si- biggest city that I have lived in. And I think in my heart, I'm probably more of a small town person. I don't like a whole lot of things going on. Uh, when I first moved to Vancouver, I was like complaining about just how busy it was and how I couldn't like deal with the metro and all the sounds and everything and like friends from like Seoul were like you don't even understand like this is a tiny city yeah so I definitely I definitely have a place for quiet small towns in my heart what about you Liz I definitely a city girl um but my husband keeps talking about one day when we retire we are going to move to a small town somewhere could be in the interior, could be on the East Coast, could be in a totally different country. And that kind of scares me. <laughs> but I'm a long way off of retirement, so I think uh, maybe I will embrace that. 
Or you have a while to change his mind. We shall see. Yes. <laughs> well, I think that our book choices are also going to represent our varied tastes and experiences today. So I think we should get right into them. Uh, Virginia, what small town book did you bring for us today? Oh, um, you're definitely right. I have completely missed the memo on the small, cozy, warm, small town thing. <laughs> And you're also right in saying that it might reflect what I think of a small town or what I imagine a small town would be like, I guess. Um, so the book that I've chosen for today is called The Brightlands and it's by John Fram. As I said, I've never lived in a small town, so I don't know how accurate this is, but it happens in a small town called Bansley in Texas. And as far as I can tell, it's a fictional town. This town has definitely developed a collective personality, a collective set of beliefs, and a collective set of the way that things are supposed to be. And it also has a shared dream and a shared hope that everyone in the town believes in. And it is all fueled by the high school football team. Yes, I read a book about football. So... The high school football team, the Bentley Bisons, is what the small town count on, on revitalizing the town. Because they firmly believe that as long as they put all the funding, all the money into this football program, they're going to go to the finals and they're going to win the championship. I don't even know if those are the right words or not. But once they won, then everybody's going to pay attention to Bentley. Everybody was going to want to come to Bentley and live there and move the kids here, sign the kids up in the football program, and then the town will prosper again. All those shops that are now closed will reopen and everybody will be fine. So they are putting all the eggs into this football basket and they really believe that this is it. This is going to be the year and we're going to win it and people are going to pay attention to us again. And you can imagine if you're on the football team, the kind of things that you can get away with because everyone knows and you know that everybody's counting on you. Everyone is going to make sure that you have everything you need and so you can get away with quite a lot of stuff and you don't really have to be accountable for a lot of things because everybody is just going to be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's just, it's the football team, you know, they're like gods, you know, like, so they can do whatever. And as the star quarterback, Dylan Whiteley is like at the top, like you can imagine that he would have everything he wants, you know, and the town will give it to him. So it was a really big surprise when his brother Joe got a text one day from Dylan and the text read, I hate this town. I hate this town. Joe has moved away from the town. There is no place for Joe in the town because Joe is gay and the town would want nothing to do with him. And after really, really ugly incidents, Joe decided that, you know what, I'm done. Like, so he left and he's moved to New York. And whenever he meet with his family, they always choose a neutral place. He will never go back to Bentley again. But he knows what that town can do to people. So when he got that text from Dylan, he was really, really concerned. So he texted him right away and he said, hey, what's up? And Dylan was like, oh, oh, sorry, wrong person. Ha ha, don't worry about it. And Joe texted back and said, hey, you know what? If you want to talk, I'm here. But he didn't hear back from Dylan. So Joe is now really quite worried because he has never got any indication that there's anything that Dylan is not happy about. So he's really, really concerned. And then hours later, like just past midnight, he got another text from Dylan and Dylan is like, you know what? Actually, it's not OK. I hate this town. I hate football. I need to get out, but they will never let me out. And he then says something like really cryptic about this place called the Brightlands. And he starts saying like how he's never going to go back and, and just all this weird text. So, so Joe right away is like, you know what? Call me, call me right now. Let's talk. But Dylan is like, no, no, I can't talk right now. You know what? Forget it. Just like, I'll talk to you tomorrow morning. Don't worry about it. And Joe, of course, worry about it. He decided, you know what? I'm going to go back. And so he got a plane ticket right away the next day, sent a picture of that to Dylan, and he wrote, I'm coming home. I'm going to get you out no matter what. 
And so he took the plane the next day on Friday night and he drove into Bentley and it was the football game on that night. And so they're playing. It was just at the end. And so he was waiting in the parking lot, waiting for the game to be over. And when the game is over, the Bisons won. So there was a big celebration. You can tell everybody in town was there. And of course, some of them recognize Joe's small town. They know who he is. But nobody really wants to talk to Joe. Nobody wants to associate with him. When Dylan finally comes out, Dylan saw his brother, gave him a big hug and be like, let's talk Monday. And Joe was like, what do you mean Monday? I'm here right now. And Dylan was like, no, I I got this fishing trip that I planned with my buddy. So I'll I'll talk to you Monday. Okay, promise. But then this is going to be the last time that Joe is going to see Dylan alive. And now Joe is stuck in a town, a hostile, hostile town that he has a big history with, and he's going to have to try to figure out what happened to Dylan. The book is described as a queer Southern thriller. And like a good thriller, you can just tell that there's all these secrets and lies, you know, that are like hidden in the little town and that everybody kind of knows it. You hear whispers about it, but like nobody really wants to talk about it. But yet you can tell everybody kind of know a little bit of something. And of course, once once Joe start poking at it, then like domino effect, things start coming out um, from everywhere. And as you're reading the book, you're peeling layers and layers of it. And it's all get into this climatic, like cinematic kind of climax at the end. And I would say this is a book for people who like Stephen King's kind of small town book. Stephen King's really good at doing these ensemble casts. And so you get the story from many, many different people point of view. Everybody's kind of knows a little bit and you're you're trying to sort of figure out what's going on as the story progresses. And like many Stephen King books, there's this supernatural, this underlying supernatural thing that is going on there. And it's the same with this book. But as you probably know from, you know, Stephen King's stories, uh, the scariest thing is often not the supernatural stuff, is very often your fellow human beings. And that is the case in this book, too. Um, so if you like that kind of story, if you like sort of a thriller with a little bit of horror in it, if you are, like me, completely baffled by the obsession about high school, college football in certain cities and certain towns, then um, this might be something of interest to you. So um, check this out. It is The Bright Lands by John Fram. Thank you, Virginia. I think that um, not always, but I definitely think that the feeling of not being able to escape a small town um, is a common one. So I think that kind of capturing that feeling in fiction is something that... uh, that people can probably relate to, especially if you are not accepted in that town as as yourself. Um, So thank you. Wonderful. Well, next, I think we are going to go to Fiona. Fiona, what small town book? You said that you are a small town person at heart. So what small town book did you bring for us today? Okay, so I love the like happy, tight-knit, small town trope where silly shenanigans happen. Um, Like I'm talking like full on Canada, small town, corner gas. I love that. Today, I have chosen a book that is not like that at all. Like uh, Virginia, I have gone with the darker side of small towns and I have chosen a very not Fiona book. I have no idea how this came up on my radar. Um, Sometimes I just put holds on audiobooks and then they take such a long time to get in forget when they come, but I'm like, well, need something to listen to. This book is called The Weight of Blood by Laura McHugh. It's a suspense thriller with a lot of murder, or not a lot of murder, but gruesome murder and um, mystery. I thoroughly enjoyed it. So I love jumping from genre to genre and finding um, just things that for the moment work really well for me. And as an audiobook, this one was really, really good. So our main character is Lucy Dane. Uh, she's 16 or 17 years old, and she lives in the small town of Henbane, where her father and uncle pretty much rule socially. They own the gas station and main diner in the small town, and many people look to them for uh, what to do in this small town. 
So Lucy has a pretty carefree life. She has a great relationship with her dad, even though she lost her mom when she was young. And she has friends. Uh, she's just generally pretty happy. One of her friends, um, Sherry, uh, has an intellectual disability. And Lucy has known her for a very long time. Um, and they're quite close. One day, when Sherry goes missing, Lucy takes it upon herself to find out what has happened. Sherry's body is found, and I will note that it is very gruesome. It's a very gruesome and upsetting murder. And Lucy decides to take it upon herself to find out what has happened. Um, you know, she was her friend, uh, but she also was someone who really fell through the cracks. No one else really cared about her. Her mother uh, ignored her. And so Lucy feels like it's really her responsibility because if she doesn't find out what happened to her, then who will? Lucy finds Sherry's necklace in an abandoned trailer in the woods. Uh, I think, I believe it's off the property of her uncle's land. And as she follows the threads to this mystery, it also becomes clear that she may be uh, following the threads to the mystery of her mother's disappearance. So, um, we actually have two storylines going on. The other is actually of her mother from two decades before. Her mother, Lila, has recently aged out of the foster system and needs to find a way to, to, live, to make a living. Uh, so she takes this job with room and board in the small town of Henbane. She thinks she's going to be working at uh, the gas station, doing odd jobs, working at the diner. And for a while, she is. However, it soon becomes clear that the organization she's gone through is part of a human trafficking ring. So the topic is very serious. Um, it's, yeah, human, human trafficking, murder, prostitution, um, content warning. There is uh, rape and um, gruesome violence and drug use in this book. Usually those are kind of no-goes for me to an extent. I really appreciate about this book. Um, I think it exists to sort of to, to give voice to the vulnerability of women in small towns. I really appreciated that dealing with these topics directly because I, I know in Nova Scotia, for instance, where I grew up, human trafficking is, is a huge issue but it's not something people talk about we talk about how nice small towns are and there are beautiful wonderful small towns um but a book like this can show you both sides of that i think sometimes hidden below the surface are these horrible horrible things that no one talks about yeah and it also was just uh so it's like i that was my justification for this is really interesting and i'm learning about this it also was just a really fun fast-paced thriller um that was very satisfying to read so definitely recommend it if you are a thriller reader and i'm looking forward to reading some other books by this author thank you fiona i, I always uh, enjoy reading outside of my genre and being challenged but also surprised uh, pleasantly surprised at uh, the enjoyment of those books so that's I'm glad that you even if there were some very difficult parts of it um, that you did did find an author that you enjoyed and and found a book that that you enjoyed as well wonderful all right well before we go to our existential question I am going to turn it over to Liz uh, to see which small town book she has brought for us today so today I'm also kind of reading outside of my usual um, wheelhouses, um, and that's in regards to where the author is from. So this book is called Man Tiger, and it's by uh, Eka Kurniawan, who is an Indonesian author, and this book was also translated by Laburali Sembiring. Now, this is a rather slim volume. It'd be probably considered a novella, but this story really packs a punch. So it was really interesting to um, read a book that is not only written by a uh, Southeast Asian author, but also takes place in a small Southeast Asian town. In this case, yes, in Indonesia, in a place on the coast 
that is sort of unnamed. So it could be anywhere along the Indonesian coast. Of course, the country has been really shaped by its political history. It was colonized by the Dutch and it was subsequently invaded uh, and occupied by Japan. So Indonesia as a country has had a really uh, tumultuous time, um, which is in all likelihood uh, shaped a lot of the experiences of the people who inhabit the country. Now, this story jumps right into it. Um, from the very first line of the book, uh, we know that a crime has taken place and who the perpetrator is. And the second line sets the scene as to where the story is taking place. On the evening Margio killed Anwar Sadat, Kai Jaro was blissfully busy with his fish pond. A scent of brine wafted through the coconut palms, the sea moaned at a high pitch, and a gentle wind ruffled the algae, coral trees, and lantanas. So right away, we know that something terrible has happened in this small, very naturalistic community. The story shifts through time, taking us from the actual crime and the immediate moments after it as the community gradually starts to learn of the murder of Anwar Sadat. Um, not to be confused with the former Egyptian president, um, that threw me for a loop if you're wondering why that name sounds familiar, has nothing to do with him. Anyways, um, we learn of course about Margio, the murderer in this book. We learn that he is 20 years old and he is a skilled boar hunter. Uh, boar hunting being one of the, I guess, activities, group activities that is much enjoyed by the young men in the village. But despite this, despite being a skilled hunter of animals, he is generally regarded as a kind person. He doesn't get up in the shenanigans that the other men his age uh, get into, such as fighting, He's more of a peacemaker. He's a good son and a brother who loves his sister and mother uh, and is polite to his elders and always willing to lend a hand. We also learn about the rest of Margio's family, including his sister Mame, his mother Nuraini, and father Komar. And Komar was a, an unloving man, a, a brutal man, and this has really shaped the lives of Margio, as well as his sister and his mother. And of course, we also learn more about the victim, Anwar Sadat, and his family, who happen to be neighbors to Margio's family. Um, and of course, this being a small town, everybody knows everybody. Uh, everybody is familiar with the comings and goings, um, but in particular, the murder victim's family had close and continuous ties with Margio's family. To top it all off, now that Margio is a man of his own, he has inherited a white tiger spirit. So just to add that mystical realism element to the story. It appeared to him one day when he was sleeping at the Surat or the temple. It was a beautiful white luxuriance tiger that he could sink his fingers into its fur and feel the warmth and softness of it. Now he had heard of this tiger from tales from his grandfather who said to him that one day you may inherit this lady tiger, it's a female tiger. One day you may inherit this tiger or you may not. It's the tiger that chooses who she decides to accompany. So while it was the grandfather's Perhaps the tiger would then go to Margio's father. Perhaps it would skip the father. Perhaps it would skip Margio and accompany any children that Margio may have. But one day the tiger appears to Margio and just as he embraces the tiger, gives it a huge hug and takes in its warmth, it disappears. And he feels this profound loss because all his life, since he's heard these stories from his grandfather, he has wanted this tiger to be his own. He's wanted the tiger to choose him. 
But it isn't long before Margio realizes that the tiger hasn't disappeared. The tiger and its spirit is actually inside Margio now. So it is always with him. Now, where that creates a complication for him is that despite being a kind person, a good son, a good neighbor, Marjo has a lot of issues. He has a lot of conflict in his heart because as mentioned, his father Komar is a brutal, brutal man. And now that Marjo is 20 and can stand up for himself and stand up for his sister and mother, that inevitably has led to some conflicts in his heart, especially now that he has this incredible predator embodied within him. So even though this book, Man Tiger, is quite short, it's a novella, it was a very interesting look at Indonesian life, Indonesian culture in a small town, and kind of looking at the mythology about animals and the environment and how that has woven itself uh, into their oral storytelling. It does a great job of shifting through time. So starting with the murder, knowing who the murderer is, but shifting back and forth as we learn more about all of the characters. And like in many small towns, we learn that maybe not everything is quite as it seems. So again, that's Man Tiger. That's by Ika Kerniawan. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Liz. Well, before we move on to our final two books, it is time for our existential question of the week. So the question that I have posed to my book friends today is, if you were going to move to a small town, say you had no choice for some, something was happening that was forcing you to move to this small town, would you miss anything? And what would you miss the most? Like what would be the thing from the city that you would not be able to live without? Or is there something? Maybe there isn't anything. Maybe you think that you could easily just slide into life in a small town. Does anyone have any initial thoughts that come to mind? having, you know, lived in a small town and gone back home sometimes. Uh, definitely sushi is on the top of my list. Um, a lot of small towns do not have a good sushi restaurant. It's very difficult. And then secondly, um, is a little bit more of a concept, which is anonymity. Um, so if I choose to go to the Safeway on Broadway and commercial in my pajamas on a Saturday morning, the odds are I'm not going to run into anyone I know it's fine. I don't really need to brush my hair. I can just do what I need to do without kind of running into someone's like, oh, hey, Kareen, you're so-and-so's daughter. What are you up to? It's like, I don't want to talk to anyone. I'm a mess. I'm a mess. I just want to be no one for a little while. So yeah, that I think I would miss because everyone knows everyone's business in a small town. So you do lose some of that anonymity. Fair. It's always by the parents as well. I know that from my childhood. You're so and so's daughter, or if you're trying to explain who you are, oh no, I'm so and so's daughter. And they're like, oh, of course you are. <laughs> Anyone else? Do you do you like the anonymity of the city? Do you would you embrace having people know you? Mine uh, definitely relates to anonymity, um, but it is choices in cafes <laughs> because, like, I. When I've lived in small towns, there's actually been like a decent selection of really good like espresso bar cafes, you know, that have like different treats. And for me, they got to have gluten free treats. And like um, I've lived in small places and they've had like two or three really good cafes. But it's that like I want to go to a cafe where people don't know me today. Like and that's not every day. But like, I want good espresso, a gluten-free treat, and no one to know me. And some days, you just got to have that. Um, so like, maybe I'd have to get my own espresso maker if I move to a small town. I don't know. <laughs> Some elaborate costumes. I was going to say you should move to Nelson, because I'm pretty sure that we have more coffee shops per like population than any other city ever anywhere. Uh, but you wouldn't get the anonymity. You you would probably still have people know you. 
Um, I think for myself, it would be just not having anything at my fingertips. Um, I think that I could, I could deal with the lack of anonymity. I, I quite enjoy running into people that I know, um, coming from Nelson, where I'm from, this happens a surprisingly large amount of time. Um, even in Vancouver, I will often, uh, run into people that I know from Nelson. I will often be recognized as someone from Nelson by random, uh, grocery cashiers at thrifties, um, never saw the person before in my life, but they know I'm from Nelson. And I kind of enjoy that. Um, I like that connection to my hometown. So I think I'd be okay with the lack of anonymity, but I would miss just having access to things, being able to go out at nine o'clock at night on a summer's night and go get ice cream, uh, which you wouldn't be able to do in some towns where things close by 6 p.m. and aren't open on Sundays. Um, so I think that would be, for me, what I would miss the most. But I can, uh, we, we've, we talk about moving back to the Coonies. So I, I can, I think I'd be able to slide relatively easily into that life again. <laughs> Liz or Virginia? I think one big consideration for me would be um, proximity to an airport. I'd love to travel. We'd love to travel, my husband and I, and back to the whole retirement thing. Um, one of the things we do want to do is to travel more. And if it's going to be a production to, you know, we're literally like one leg of your journey is getting on the plane to get to your intended destination. Um, especially, you know, when we're older, I, it doesn't really, that doesn't really appeal to me. So, you know, proximity to, to travel would be nice. That's fair. That's totally fair. All right, Virginia, I feel like I was warned that there would be a long list from you. Like everything, you mean like <laughs> everything that you can name, what you can find in a city? I like, I really don't know what, yeah, I, I can't even imagine like when, when Fiona said corner guest, I'm like, that's that's the only small town I've actually been in. Like when we drove by, we were like, let's go to Rulo so we can actually see corner gas, you know? So that was very exciting. But I'm like, I would never want to live here. No, thank you. Um, but yeah, it's like, I, 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 I feel like the biggest thing is because I come from a place where you have like all, like people everywhere and cars everywhere and noise everywhere. So I think I would miss that, even though I don't like crowds, but I think I would miss that they're like, noises everywhere those city noises it's weird for me it's comfortable those noises are comfortable be able to hear like people honking at each other you know and, like it feels like oh yeah i'm home you know so i think that's really but yeah definitely sadie like you said access to things in general and but just everything so yeah there's definitely too quiet this is something that i never realized growing up, but when I went back to my, my hometown and, um, I have family and friends who kind of similar to you, Kareen, live outside of the main town, um, and halfway up a mountain. And I remember staying at, at one of their houses and at night, just not being able to sleep because it was too quiet. There was just nothing like no sound at all, which, I can probably be very appealing, but it was just a little unnerving coming from living on 12th Avenue and having sirens going by literally all every hour of the day. <laughs> That's something I still haven't gotten used to is how many sirens there are all the time. And like, cause every time I hear a siren, like, you know, internally, it's like something bad is happening. So it's just like this feeling bad things are always happening. <laughs> Or people are getting to the help that they need. <laughs> yeah, maybe. No. All right. <laughs> On that note, <laughs> let us hear from our last two books today. Uh, Karine, I'm going to go to you and see what small town book you have brought us today. Thank you, Sadie. And yes, it is a small town. It is the small town of Sycamore in Jamaica that we are going to be visiting next. And it is about a young 12 year old girl named Clara. And Clara still remembers a lot of things. She remembers her full name, Clarity Henson. She remembers where she lives. She can find her way up Sycamore Hill 
through Mrs. G's backyard, the fastest way, day or night, to go back home. She remembers her friend, Gaina, or at least that they used to be friends, even though Gaina is not really acting like it right now. Um, she remembers that she loves mangoes. She remembers the location of the secret hideout that she had with her friends. But what Clara cannot remember is what happened last summer after the hurricane. No matter how hard she tries, no matter how many times her mama tells her what happened during that summer, for Clara, it is just blackness, a blank, darkness. She cannot remember anything that happened that summer. Sometimes she gets a little inkling of what might have happened. She used to love to surf. Her papa has a fishing boat and he goes out every morning and she remembers that she really used to love surfing during that time when he was out on the water and they would share that special time together. But ever since that summer, every time she gets near the water, she feels something in her panic, that there's this wrongness with the water, that there's this wrongness of her being close to it. And even though she can't remember why, she can't get over it. And it's coming up on a year of the anniversary of that hurricane. And Clara is finding it hard to adjust. Her best friend Gaina is being kind of strange and distant towards her. The kids at school are still making fun of her because she can't remember what happened to her. But all this kind of changes when a new visitor comes to the island. Now, Sycamore is not a tourist location. It is a very, very small community off the beaten path of resorts. The last time they had two visitors, it was because they got lost on their way to the Bob Marley Museum. Um, the time before that, it was some strange ghost hunters that wanted to talk to her uncle, Eldorath, who apparently can see ghosts, even though no one in the community talks about that. But this is a new kind of visitor. It's a young girl named Rudy. And she, like all the people in Claire's community, is also Black, but from America. So it is a really interesting thing for all the kids there to try and get Rudy to play their games that they play, the songs that they sing. And Clara has the opportunity to make a new friend. But as the summer goes on, more and more things happen to Clara that make her want to discover and remember what happened that summer. Um, this is the debut book by a fellow Kareen, but spelled differently, Kareen Getton. And it is When Life Gives You Mangoes. And it is a little bit based on the author's experience of growing up in Jamaica, growing up in a small town there. This is a wonderful debut novel. It's a wonderful read aloud. It's uh, definitely kind of middle school. So ages about nine to 12. But as an adult, I really loved it and enjoyed it. She writes so wonderfully about kind of about that golden summer of childhood when you get out of school and you can just like roam through the neighborhood accountable to no one, lords of all that you survey. But it's also like a wonderfully poignant look at, uh, at someone uh, with a disability. It is a beautiful story about community and a different look and a different story coming out of Jamaica than often that we see. We think of it as a tourist island and don't think of the people that actually live there. And I think that Getton does a wonderful job of kind of balancing that view um, with a really poignant, wonderful, exciting adventure story. So I would heartily recommend When Life Gives You Mangoes if you're looking for a great book for a middle schooler in your life or you're just interested in having another look at Jamaica through the eyes of a child. Thank you, Karine. I think that one is definitely going to go on my to-read list. All right, well, for our final book, I am going to talk about a book today um, that I first was drawn to very specifically because of the setting of this book. And not only that it took place in a small town, but because of the specific small town that it took place in. So one of my favorite things um, when I am reading a book is when they are set in places that I am familiar with. I like to see the familiar landmarks. I like to be able, I think it helps 
there's there's so much that you can picture in your mind just based on the author's words. But when you know a city or you know a town so well and can actually picture the exact places and the exact kind of um, streets uh, that these characters are moving down, it just, for myself, it just adds that extra layer to the story of it. So the book that I have chosen to talk about today takes place very close to my hometown of Nelson. It takes place in the Kootenays and it takes place in a fictional town. And um, we had the author of this book on a uh, talk last year and uh, they specifically said that they have not released the name of the actual town that this book is based on so I will do the same Uh, but it takes place in a fictional town about an hour outside of Nelson called King's Cove. So I'm going to be talking about A Killer in King's Cove uh, by Iona Wishaw. Uh, It is the first book of the Lane Winslow mystery series and as I said it takes place in the Kootenays. It takes place in an idyllic small community on the water uh, in the interior of British Columbia. There's a very small cast of characters in this story. Uh, Kings Cove itself um, does not have that many residents. Everybody literally knows everybody else. And so when Lane in 1946 arrives in Kings Cove, everybody already knows her. Everybody is already expecting this new person who has bought this house. So Lane has decided that after she was an undercover intelligence officer in World War II, she needs to escape a little bit. And she saw a poster advertising British Columbia, and she thought that that was the perfect place for her to go. So she has moved and to start a new life in Kings Cove. She has her house, which she is very excited to turn into her own space. It's going to be just for her. Shortly after she gets there, though, she is out walking in the forest behind her house. Um, Her and a neighbor are investigating an issue with the water that, that comes from the creek. And they're walking up through the creek and they find the body of a man. And this man has been shoved inside of the kind of the storm drain, the where the water is coming out of, and he has been murdered. Nobody knows who this is, which for such a small community is quite surprising that nobody has an idea who this person is. Um, they don't remember him coming to town. They don't know what his connection to this small community is. So they call in the police from the big bustling metropolitan of Nelson, an hour away. And they call in Inspector Darling and Ames, um, and they come to investigate the murder. Now, because it was this was found uh, close to Lane's property, she... It's kind of questioned about what what she found. Um, she she wants to kind of help them out as much as she can, but the more the investigation goes on, the more it looks like a connection might be forming to Lane herself. Now Lane has never seen this man. She doesn't know who he is. She's never talked to him. She's he's never approached her before he he got killed. So she doesn't quite know what this connection is. But the more they investigate, it seems like there is a connection between herself and this murdered man. Uh, So this is a cozy mystery in the most coziest of senses. Um, It is quite a gentle pace um, as you work through the mystery. It it just transports you right to this little small idyllic town that, as you realize, as most small towns do, has secrets of its own, as the residents have secrets that uh, when you know someone as well as the people in this town know each other, You might not think that they do, but there's more to people than you think. It's about the secrets that come out. It's about Lane trying to start a new life and her past potentially coming back to cause problems with that. It is about the kind of the connection that she has with the inspector, whether it's a good connection or a bad connection. I won't uh, I won't mention it at this point, but um, kind of the gruff inspector that she's trying to deal with. And over the whole thing is this mystery that you can try and solve along with Lane and the inspector. Uh, it's a great book for fans of um, Jacqueline Winspears, the Maisie Dobbs series, kind of post-World War. Uh, you kind of 
have have all those memories from the war and people trying to get their lives back on track um, in the aftermath of that. So if you're looking for a nice, cozy mystery series that has a BC connection, um, you can look at the Lane Winslow series. I believe there is now eight or nine books in this series. There's a new one coming out um, in April. Green's counting. <laughs> I think it was eight or eight or nine, I think. <laughs> um, so yeah, so that is Killer in King's Cove by Iona Wishaw. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for humoring me in my small town discussion. Um, I do. I, I think I am a small town person at heart as well. And so I do enjoy reading about them. Um, it has been so wonderful to hear everyone's book choices. I always love to see uh, the differences and the similarities between, between our books. Um, maybe only one book this time that didn't have murder in it. Maybe. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, only one book that didn't have murder in it. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you again, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in and we will hopefully see you again next week for another episode of Keep It Fictional. Have a wonderful week, everyone. Bye. Thank you for listening. If you like our show, please tell a fellow book lover about it. You can find a list of all the books we discussed in our show notes. Join us next week for another fun book chat. Until then, keep it fictional.